Hey, my name is Tyler Lynch. I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. I focus on strategic ed tech customers. I've been doing software engineering for about 20 years, many different languages from JavaScript to VB, original, VB.net, C Sharp, Java, Python, Perl. Um, and CDK kind of changed the way that I thought about defining my infrastructure. I've been working with the Blackboard team over the last year or so on this project. And I'm Ryan Bogle. I'm on the enterprise architecture team for Blackboard. Um, I primarily work in infrastructure and cloud. Um, and work uh, quite closely with our platform engineering team in terms of, of software deployment infrastructure and work with Tyler on a daily basis uh, implementing AWS best practices. So the theme of our talk today is um, how we help our Blackboard teams deliver software faster with more confidence as we move and uh, mature our journey into the cloud. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the importance of AWS CDK for us, um, and then give some examples about how we leverage CDK and some of the other AWS services to improve that developer experience, um, and, and, and we'll go through um, what we built and, and why. So I joined Blackboard uh, about two and a half years ago, really excited about the opportunity to work um, in this next wave of ed tech innovation on a global scale. Blackboard uh, supports 150 million learners, parents, educators, administrators around the globe across K-12, higher ed, business, and government uh, learning institutions. I'll talk a little bit about um, the engineering culture and practices at, at Blackboard. So we, we deliver more than a dozen uh, individual products and services aimed at facilitating kind of every aspect of, of ed educational technology. To do that well uh, and support as, as, as best as possible, we've uh, built out a global engineering uh, workforce uh, across four different continents. And as a software organiz de delivery organization, we uh, value uh, empowering our teams to use the, the, the best tool for the job. So we encourage our teams to use whatever tech stack or language they feel most comfortable in, in building out the solution to their problems. We're on a new phase in our, our journey uh, in AWS Cloud, where we're re-architecting actively all of our products and services to be part of a microservices ecosystem um, that forms the foundation of our uh, next-gen EdTech platform. So to do that, we're really forcing a shift in the way our developers design, build, and deploy software to be able to leverage all the best practices in a cloud-native paradigm. And we know that we would need to address a bunch of pain points as we make the developers shift their practices. So we, we really had to think about how we could ease the, the learning curve for adopting cloud-native technologies. Um, we wanted to be able to support a transition to full-stack engineering, where uh, engineers need to um, not just build, but also operate and deploy their services. And then we wanted to help ensure adherence to a wide swath of compliance and security and operability best practices. So to address those things while we're transforming our software delivery re really required us to think about how we could democratize and ease the, the, all the undifferentiated heavy lifting that, that teams would need to consider in adopting microservices in a cloud-native architecture. Um, Full-stack teams now have to own operability, reliability, and scalability, and so we wanted to consider tooling and best practices that would enable growth in cloud maturity as well as DevOps maturity for those teams. Um, we, want, we knew that getting observability right for these teams takes a lot of time and expertise, and so we wanted to see if we could find ways to ease the lift for those teams and provide tooling and services to support them. And then we wanted to tie all these things together in an internal platform, but open platform approach where we could provide uh, guardrails and safety for the teams, um, all the while kind of reducing the complexities for, for operability and, and best practice. And so Blackboard looked to AWS and asked us, what do we have to help enable teams, lots of teams, 79 teams distributed globally to achieve their goals? And so this is the AWS CDK or the AWS Cloud Development Kit. If you're not familiar, the AWS CDK is a multi-language capable 
framework for modeling your cloud infrastructure. So you can use the language of choice. I love C Sharp, I use C Sharp in it all the time. TypeScript, Python, Perl. Uh, Golang is coming soon, it's currently in preview. And it allows you to write code that is your infrastructure. And you can see it here. Very simple example, there's a VPC, a DynamoDB table, they're linked together. You get all the nice things that you love in your language of choice, in your IDE of choice. I like Visual Studio Code. Anybody else use VS Code? Anybody? I think most people really use it now. It's amazing, I love it. It does introspection, it does autocomplete, it does inline documentation, it tells me what's wrong. If I'm using TypeScript, I get strong typing as well. So when I go to build this, we know things are right. Um, <clears throat> this eases the developer experience and stops runtime errors, but it lets the developers stay in the language that they're familiar with. They're not shifting from YAML or HCL or something else back into the language of choice. It is the language you know and love, you get to work in it. You also get all the great things about that language, polymorphism, loops, conditional logic, things that just aren't possible in today's other tooling for IAC. So with the 3D, uh, with the CDK, there's three main components. There's our core framework, and I'll start at the bottom and talk about how these relate to each other and work their way up. A resource is something inside of a service. So you think of Amazon S3 as a service, a resource is a bucket or an access point that belongs to that service. Resources can belong to stacks. Stacks have a one-to-one -one mapping of like a cloud formation stack, again, service specific. And then an app can have multiple services composed together so think maybe a REST API with an API gateway, a Lambda, and a bucket behind it. And this is that really powerful composition that you all know and love with the AWS Cloud. We give you these tools, you wire them together, you deliver solutions that are holistic and much easier to lift, right, that cognitive burden. The CDK provides that same level of interoperability and pluggability, but in the language of your choice. It's pretty awesome. Then we have the AWS Construct Library, which is a library of public, reusable components uh, known as constructs. And we'll talk about the different types of constructs on the next slide. <clears throat> this is where you can find AWS provided or third party provided solutions that can plug together. Um, again, you can find something like an REST API, DynamoDB streams, maybe you want auditability. They all exist on these libraries and Blackboard uses a public library and they built their own internally. Then there's the CDK toolkit, also known as the CDK CLI. This is your main way to interact with CDK. You can initialize a new project, which you give it your language, project type, puts all the scaffolding down there for you and you can start working in it right away. Uh, TypeScript, C Sharp, whatever you like. It also allows you to initialize that project, uh, do diff detection between the cloud and what you currently have defined, uh, and all those things. So it's your main way to interact with it. Those are the three components. The workflow is pretty linear. It's very similar to what you would do in any other kind of development. Write some code, build some code, deploy some code, but a little bit easier. So initializing a new project, like I said, gives you all that bootstrapping and scaffolding that you get to start with. Uh, it's really, really handy, right? It's boilerplate stuff that you don't want to have to write. CDK init will give that to you. As you write your code, now you want to build it and do maybe strong type checking. Using TypeScript, you, you get that out of the box, and that command would be npm run build, which will run the TypeScript comp compiler, transpiler technically, do the strong typing, verify things are right. Then you would synthesize your CloudFormation uh, templates and assets, which we call a cloud assembly from that. It's really important, so it takes what you've written in your language of choice and synthesizes CloudFormation as an output. It, that includes things like your Lambda code, right? So it's not only just your CloudFormation template, it's the code you want to run serverlessly, comes together in this cloud assembly, sends it to CloudFormation for deployment, including dropping that in an S3 bucket or running it in a Lambda. The CDK diff will actually diff what is in your AWS Cloud account versus what you have defined, and then the deploy is the deployment. Oftentimes I get asked by friends, customers, my husband, what's the difference between CloudFormation and Terraform and CDK? I just don't get it. They sound substantially similar to me. And the thing that I want you to leave here with is we all know configuration as code, that is CloudFormation, that's Terraform, and these are declarative formats that talk about desired state. I want my thing to look like this when it's done. It's wonderful, it's worked really well, it allows for automation, portability. Um, but with CDK, it's different. It's, configuration is code. This is, again, your favorite programming language where you can do all the things you wanna do, build reusable components, you can stitch together very easily, you can do looping, 
for constructs, any number of things that you can do in code. And I think this is the, the power, right? Abstract classes, inheritance, um, where you can start to build common components that inherit from each other in constructs and deliver those to your customers. You can also use aspects, which I think Ryan will talk about a little bit from an aspect perspective. The workflow is a bit of a paradigm shift. So with CloudFormation, you are building a parameterized template, and you'll take that template and give it to CloudFormation, and you can spin up stack one, stack two. And that works really well. With CDK, though, you actually can generate multiple different templates. And this is where you can define different environments. So let's say you don't want to do something like a high availability da database in dev, but you certainly want that in your load test environment or your production. It allows for this natively, and it's, it's really well supported. So you can use less expensive resources in lower environments or change them out. There are three levels of constructs, L1, L2, and L3 with CDK. L1 constructs are automatically generated, and they're based off CloudFormation resources. So anything supported in CloudFormation is supported here. We automatically generate those. L2 are higher level constructs that are service specific. Again, that's like an S3 is the service, a bucket and an access point are resources of that service. L2 is specific to a specific service. L3 is the composition of those services into something that you want. And this is where Blackboard has built L3 constructs and there's plenty of them out there on constructs.dev, I believe is the website that's publicly available. Think of this as, uh, I wanna build a REST API, I want that Lambda, I want it to write to DynamoDB or something else. It is a composition of services together that is abstracted away. They're opinionated intentionally, and they have sane and safe defaults. We, we look at these from best practices, well-architected as we produce them, and we publish them as ourselves and third parties. Wouldn't we do my job if I didn't talk about multiple account strategies and how important this is to you? Has anybody in this room ever had somebody change a security group on you? Or break your application on accident, and you're like, how did that happen? I didn't make any changes. That's, most people can relate to that. But there's more. There's also when you need to start accounting for the workload and what does it cost you to run on AWS. When you start running multiple workloads in the same account, understanding things like who's paying for what, what's generating what, especially around data transfer, can get diff difficult. So these are the responsibilities and things that I think about. If you have multiple teams working, probably want to have them in separate accounts. If you need to do billing and allocation, your account is your best boundary for billing and allocation because it also ca captures data transfer. Or just isolation. I don't want something else to mess with what I'm running. There could be different reasons for isolation. There could be this workload is super sensitive and secure and it has different security controls than this other workload. Maybe one is line of business, it's a HR application with employee data and you want that secured. Or business processes, it's not uncommon for larger companies to have different release cadences and business processes that dictate when they release. And you, you wanna keep those separate. So allow this team to work in their own accounts. They can run whatever process they want with whatever security controls they need. And if you needed to, you can orchestrate that governance at the organization level. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about what Blackboard's done with CDK and some of the constructs to um, provide scaffolding and bootstrapping uh, for our team so that they can move faster. Um, this is a great place for me to just take a second and uh, give kudos and credit to uh, the engineering teams in Blackboard, uh, especially our platform engineering team who have worked tremendously hard to think about our developer experience and how important that is into the, into the process of software delivery and all the time and effort they put into building uh, these services and tooling for our teams. So uh, Tyler outlined um, some, some great business and technical strategies, um, reasons for adopting a multi-account strategy. Um, <clears throat> but as an organization, we knew we wanted to adopt that. We had to think about what the implications were for our software delivery lifecycle and for the developer experience. We, we know we wanted to consider uh, how we could integrate multiple environments and stages as part of a lifecycle promotion process and simplify how teams manage and deploy across all these different service accounts as they map to a different environment or stage in the, in the lifecycle. Um, we needed to be able to provide for data sovereignty with, um, in between the different environments and then within an environment between regions, right? Um, 
And we needed to be able to figure out how to kind of minimize all the complexity as much as possible for teams when they're managing and deploying to all these accounts in all these regions. So to that end, we've focused on providing a set of shared developer services, services, tooling, and some reusable components that comprise kind of what we call our thinnest viable platform, built uh, really right on top of AWS services and using AWS CDK. One of our key practices and cultural drivers in this platform approach um, has been uh, the use of Intersource. And Intersource is really uh, just taking open source practices for software development, but, but um, containing them within the organizational boundary, right? So software changes aren't necessarily made um, open to the public, but they are made open and available to other engineering teams within the organization. So we take the sort of collaborative and contributive approach to our platform engineering um, as we develop the internal tooling. And so this model, teams are sort of free to um, and encouraged to be able to build and contribute to the platform engineering uh, efforts. Um, and then through that inner source approach, they're able to also codify and socialize the services and patterns and best practices that they've learned over time and share those with the other engineering teams. One of the great things about this inner source approach is that it provides our platform engineering and architecture teams direct feedback and input into what's important to the software delivery teams uh, and engineering teams. Yeah, I want to double click on this for a second because I think it's a really important salient point. When I've worked on Scrum teams before and I was given tooling by the architecture team or the DevOps team, and sometimes it was rough, it was rough to work with, and it didn't do everything I needed to do. So Blackboard's looked at that experience and said, well, make a pull request, right? If things aren't doing what you needed to do and it's not there, it's on you as an engineer and an engineering team to make that pull request and they'll be reviewed. And they're honoring that review process just like you would in open source. It's super powerful, it's super empowering, and it stops some of the friction that natively comes from a development team being asked to use tooling that's built in-house. Right now they can control the destiny of that. Super important. Yeah, so um, a great example of, of some of the work we've done in CDK and taking an inner source approach um, was this monitoring construct that uh, the team developed, um, largely inspired by a project called CDK Watchful. Uh, if if um, you get an opportunity, go check it out. It's uh, an open source project and does an amazing job of easing the lift on, on implementing monitoring for CDK stacks. Um, we took those concepts and basically customized it uh, to, to work in our multi-account, multi-region uh, software deployment infrastructure. Um, but the, the goals here were really to give teams the capability um, to customize metrics, thresholds, and alerting um, and apply it uh, in one simple step across their entire stack. Um, so the way this works is we, we implement um, both inheritance and the level three constructs that Tyler talked about. Um, we build and wrote that in TypeScript and we transpile that across multiple languages uh, and make that available in our code uh, artifact repository. So teams can basically just import a dependency um, on that construct library and then easily implement the monitoring that they want. So does that mean that teams using Python can use this thing you wrote in TypeScript? Yeah, totally. So um, currently we support uh, both TypeScript and Python um, and are able to transpile into any other language that CDK supports. Yeah. So um, here I'm just gonna uh, I'll spend a bunch of slides in each one of these use cases sort of illustrating what the developer experience looks like and kind of architecturally what, what's happening behind the scenes. So uh, like I said, this is a super easy lift for teams to um, be able to implement uh, monitoring with sane and safe defaults across their entire application and infrastructure stack. Um, and it's as simple as basically importing our custom construct from our library. And throughout my slides, you'll see I'm, I'm using the example of a pizza company. Um, just to sort of genericize the use cases here. Um, so the Pizza Factory service wants to implement monitoring across all of its uh, infrastructure and application stack. Um, it imports the monitoring construct and then sets a bunch of defaults, provides a dashboard, SNS topics for where alerts can go, and then passes the, the CDK stack to that monitoring construct. 
what happens behind the scene is really cool at deploy time. The monitoring construct actually introspects the stack and walks the whole tree of resources, turning on metrics and thresholds and alerts for every single resource that CloudFormation supports that's in that stack. So it's a one line of code and you get metrics, thresholds, and alerts across every resource that you're deploying if it's supported. Um, it does provide the ability. Uh, so in our, in our uh, instance of this, what we've done is, is added some capabilities to be able to, deploy, to replicate that monitoring stack across all of our account environments for that team, as well as replicate that across regions within those environments. Um, and it does provide the opportunity for teams to be able to then customize and tweak the, the thresholds and the alerting and even the dashboard widgets that are created depending on the environment, the, um, the stage in the life cycle or the region that things are getting deployed to. So you can have it all the same across the board or you can have it customized depending on the life cycle. As we discussed, one of the, the big things we were concerned about was a service for developers that could support deployment across multiple accounts and multiple regions in a standardized and compliant way. We, we wanted to make sure we could provide teams with a standard CI-CD pipeline process with, that we could help them with standardized uh, stages within that pipeline, as well as um, insert compliant uh, and required actions within each of those stages along the, the life cycle. We wanted to be able to support a flexible open model where we could use Git operations um, for deployment and promotion, so something that's very familiar to developers um, to be able to, to um, promote uh, and deploy their software. And we wanted that system to retain a self-updating capability so that any time as we improve and mature our best practices, our security practices, and change our compliance, um, we could update everyone's pipelines to, to adhere to those new compliance structures. So we, we built a thing we call Pipeline Forge, and it's a pipeline that builds other pipelines. The whole thing is built in CDK. Um, the, the Pipeline Forge basically deploys a, a templated CDK code pipeline for every service that requests one. Um, and, and the way this works, uh, it's a CDK stack that uh, both deploys the controlling pipeline, the Forge pipeline, which on execution, the first thing it does is actually update itself to, make, to, to implement any changes. Um, it then checks to make sure that every account that it knows about and is building a pipeline for uh, is correctly configured to, to enable code pipeline and code build to deploy there. So it does things like insert IAM roles and replication S3 buckets across regions and across uh, multiple accounts. And then it builds or updates every single client pipeline that it, that it has within its, its account. So we keep all the pipelines in a centralized account and they can deploy out across multiple accounts. Um, this makes that the, the, the execution and maintenance of the forge um, easily able to, to trigger just through Git ops, um, just the way that uh, software development and, and engineering teams are used to our platform engineering can team can maintain the Pipeline Forge service just through um, traditional git commit and, and pull requests. So here's an example um, of the, the couple steps that teams need to do uh, to be able to leverage the Pipeline Forge. So the first thing is requesting a pipeline. And, and as I said, we use Git ops for that. So when a team wants to have a pipeline for their new service, they uh, create a pull request to the Pipeline Forge repository. And in that pipeline, uh, in that pull request, they, they basically submit a configuration file for the pipeline that they're asking for. And um, it does a, a few of the things you would normally expect. Um, sets, sets some naming standards, details the regions it, it knows it, it wants to deploy to, um, gives the location for the, the Git repo for that uh, application stack and infrastructure stack, um, and uh, sets a bunch of tagging um, that we require, and, and this is a nice insertion point for us to be able to um, standardize on a set of tags um, that we require every infrastructure and application stack to have. Um, 
And then one of the interesting things uh, that we've, we've done, um, because we're building pipelines on behalf of teams who are, who, which is gonna have the capability to create resources in accounts and regions across AWS, we uh, have carefully considered how to construct uh, a very least privilege uh, IAM permission boundary around that pipeline and its capabilities. So the teams tell us through this configuration file um, what services they plan on using, and then the pipeline forge actually constructs a custom IAM boundary for that pipeline um, so that it's only able to actually deploy and update those services uh, in those accounts. So your pipeline for the service doesn't run as the root user? No. Crazy. Right. Oh, wait. Hang on. So, so the teams, so the teams uh, make a pull request with this configuration file. And the beauty of this is then the platform engineering team and the architects have a chance to actually uh, review that request, right? So this is where we have a little uh, gateway um, for governance and auditability on changes that are going to happen. When uh, everything matches up um, to our standards and requirements, then that request can get merged. And that triggers the pipeline forge to start doing what it does. Um, so it will check the accounts that it's going to deploy uh, this, this new uh, pipeline is going to deploy to, um, make sure that the IAM roles, the CDK bootstrapping, uh, and replication buckets are all ready to go. And then it actually constructs the pipeline, which is ready to go and hooked up to the repo for that team. So then the teams can just write their application and infrastructure code and not have to worry about how to deploy it. Um, all they have to do is basically import our pipeline forge construct at the very top of their CDK stack and use this from end method um, passing in their stack, um, which then allows the pipeline forge to iterate over that stack and, and create a new deployment and uh, synthesize a cloud formation template for every account and every re uh, region within that account to replicate that stack in deployment. And we've, we've built the templating such that teams can opt in um, or opt out of different manual approval gateways depending on uh, the promotion between stages. So we've talked a, a bit about multi-account and software deployment um, and CI, CD, and monitoring. Um, another big piece of our microservice uh, strategy and platform approach is asynchronous messaging and uh, event-driven architectures. And we knew there's a, a lot of complexity um, for teams to consider to be able to do this well and do it at an enterprise scale. And we're talking about potentially hundreds of microservices needing to be able to um, sub publish and subscribe to messages across multiple accounts um, in, in AWS. And so we, needed to, we, we wanted to spend a bunch of time trying to think about how we could get this right with the, the least amount of effort. And so we looked at AWS to say, well, how can we do this? And we started talking about event-driven architectures, event-driven design, and what are the reasons we want to do this? Let's make sure that we're gonna go through this effort we understand the benefits of it and what the operational burden could potentially be, and then we'll talk about how to lower that burden. So the reason you do event-driven architecture is for loose coupling, right? It's really that level of isolation. I can asynchronously send a message or an event to this thing to happen, and I can trust that if that message was received, that service will do it. That was a lot of a paradigm shift for the developers. They're used to doing something, checking the status, making sure it got written. I'm like, you have to have trust. You trust the other services in this, and there was a lot of conversations about, I don't trust that service to do what it says it's gonna do. Um, so there's that cultural change that was a barrier that we had to work through. But intentionally, we wanted that loose coupling for scalability, for extensibility, and for availability. So I'll dive into scalability. I can scale my independent services, they're all serverless in this case, but if they weren't, we can scale those things individually that need to process individually. If they're gonna send batch processing, well, we can scale the batch process and scale it back down, not affect everything else. Extensibility is really important. So today they can send a message to the pizza service to go generate a pizza, and that's just fine. That pizza service will go build a pizza, and then they'll send a notice to the delivery service to go deliver that pizza, and that's great. But what happens if uh, my pizza shop's gonna go IPO, and now I need like SOX compliant auditing? Well, I need to know about all those orders, and so I can spin up another consumer 
that listens for those order messages, it's just extensible. I can grab it and I can archive it off in a write once, read only place that I can talk to my auditors about and now I have SOX compliance. And so that extensibility is a really important part of event-driven architecture. They are sending out messages and the consumers can choose which messages with which format they want to consume and the producer doesn't have to change. They can extend that chain as much as they want to. And so they looked to Amazon for this. And so Amazon Event Bridge, AKA CloudWatch Events is what we used to call it, has been extended and they are heavily using this and customizing it. So Event Bridge is really an event bus. Uh, it has event sources. Today you have AWS services that can send events. You might know this like S3 can notify you when a new file was uploaded, right? Um, these kind of events that AWS gives you, you work with all the time, you wire up Lambdas to them. That is based on event bridge with the backbone that pipes those between services. You can also have custom events, which the Blackboard is using. And then there's SaaS apps. So SaaS like Salesforce, Zapier, and other tools that we've partnered with have their own set of like producing events that you can bring in. Beyond that, you actually have the buses. Every AWS account has a default event bus that AWS services no notices go over. You can also build multiple custom event buses, which Blackboard has decided to do. And then you have the SaaS event bus for the SaaS partners. So now you've got these events getting produced. They hit an event bus. How do you know where they go? And that's where rules come in. The rules can be declarative, they can be wildcard, and you can start to specify of messages that look like type X, I want to receive them. And you, you define that as a consumer of those events. Consumers can be AWS services, HDB targets, any number of things can be consumers of these events. We also have client libraries consume these events as well. So uh, EventBridge looked really promising, right? We could get out of the business of worrying about how to manage uh, an enterprise level messaging bus, which um, can, can be a real pain and a challenge. Um, but we knew that um, it wasn't necessarily taking into consideration the developer experience when it relates to how you do this in a multi-count environment, right? So um, a nice piece of EventBridge is that it can deliver events across accounts. But to do that, there's a lot of out-of-band negotiation between account owners and developers on getting accounts and services configured in the right way to enable that to happen, right? So you need to be able to, in an account that's publishing and wants to be able to send events to another account, you need to be able to configure a specific rule with a specific pattern. You need to have IAM roles set in both the sender and the receiving accounts, right? So there's, there's a whole bunch of con sort of contract negotiation that has to go on um, between account owners to enable that flow of messaging from one event bus to another in an account. Um, the, the, um, so we wanted to try to address all of that sort of hard work that would happen uh, out of band and outside of infrastructure deployment in, in a simple and easy to use way for the development teams. So we built something we call Event Hub. Um, we had a couple iterations in, in, the, in the project on this and, and tried a couple different approaches and we, we finally um, landed on a, a, a very nice distributed architecture that, that really focuses on the, the brokering of a pub sub contract as well as um, a, the ability to provide an enterprise schema, event schema catalog. So we, we leverage um, event bridge underneath and just add a, a light layer of, of uh, serverless service on top of that. Um, so we use the schema registry in event bridge. Um, this is a really nice feature. It takes an open API spec for an event and, and, and registers it there so that you can uh, easily uh, find uh, events and understand what the data structure for that event looks like. Um, we wanted to be able to provide that at an enterprise level, right? So um, we created a REST API in front of that that allows any of our um, development teams to be able to search all the events that are, all uh, schemas that are stored there. Um, then we also create uh, registries for a mapping between uh, a pu publishers of events and the accounts that those events are actually uh, emanating from 
and then subscribers who are interested in the schema in the Red Central Registry catalog uh, and the accounts where they would like those events to be delivered to. So when a, a request for a subscription comes in, that mapping is made and then a rule is actually placed on behalf of the subscriber into the publisher's account and, and sets up the, the transfer for events to happen on behalf of the two accounts. Um, one really nice thing we did focusing on the developer experience was we used a, a CloudFormation custom resource to be able to sort of provide uh, a, a CloudFormation level um, interaction for the, the APIs and the service. And then we built a construct in CDK to wrap around that cloud formation. So what that does is enables the teams to actually specify the publication of schema, the schema registry, as, and the subscription to schema um, all in infrastructure, in their infrastructure, and it all gets configured at deploy time. So there's none of that out of band negotiation between teams about send me this, set up this rule, give me that pattern, right? So one of the things that interests me is you have this centralized schema registry now for 79 teams to use and 15 different product teams. How do you understand and govern what type of schema is going to get created so there's not overlap? Is, is there a practice that you've employed for that? We, we've really focused on, on um, a lot of domain-driven design, and teams are very focused on, on building workloads and capabilities that, that are um, within that domain. So we, we spend a lot of time on governance around architecture and the design of, of, of services. So uh, events are going to be unique to, to workloads um, and, and those services. Um, but we've also worked to set up sort of standards um, about, about fields and structures around those events. So teams can, can count on getting certain things uh, no matter what event it is in the Blackboard ecosystem. So for those of you in the audience, if you've never done DDD or domain-driven design, Martin Fowler has a wonderful book called DDD Quickly. It is very short, it's a nice ramp up. As you start to work with other teams and you have things that look similar, a user object can mean two different things in two different systems, but the principle is the same. It, it's a great book, and it's a great way to start thinking about architecture that's loosely coupled, so we can have two systems speak the same language, even they handle the implementations differently internally. And that's what Blackboard has gone through, that practice of understanding and implementing. Right, so um, I'll use this scenario of a serverless uh, pizza shop to um, illustrate how we're doing the event messaging and what that developer experience looks like. So just imagine you've got multiple microservices, you have a order, uh, pizza ordering microservice that receives orders, you have the pizza factory service which actually bakes the pizzas, and you have a pizza delivery service that, that um, actually delivers the pizzas. And each one in that chain needs to know when the other one's job has been completed, right? When an event happens. So pizza ordering gets, uh, gets a, uh, an order and it needs to notify the factory it's time to start building my large pepperoni pizza. The pizza factory, when that pizza is done, then needs to notify delivery that I'm hungry and I'm, I'm waiting and that pizza is ready to go. So thinking about how this works in terms of that scenario with Event Hub, imagine the pizza factory wants to pu be able to um, publish events to the schema registry for a pizza ready event, right? The, the pizza is done baking. So it, it, um, they would just import this event bus construct, which adds a little um, syntactic sugar around the standard event bus construct in CDK and helps our event bus service uh, gain access to and understand the, the event bus in this publisher's account. Then they publish a schema and all they have to do there is import a schema object Create, they do have to create an open API spec file um, which details what that schema structure looks like. Um, but then they, they tell uh, the, the schema object where that file exists, um, the event bus that's actually gonna be uh, generating those events, um, and you know some naming standards around that. And then they need to um, basically tell the event bus that they created here is the source of events that are going to be delivered. So in this case, they've built a, a Lambda function in Python that's going to actually generate the events when that, uh, when that pizza is complete. The important thing here I see is this event bus.grant put events. What is that? 
Yeah, so that, that is what I was just saying is that that just gives uh, permission to that Lambda to actually deliver events to that event bus. And what happens when this stack gets published is the, uh, the publisher mapping between the schema and the publisher account gets inserted into the publisher registry. Um, and uh, all the configuration checks are made on that publisher account to ensure that Event Hub can do the, the next step in the work that it needs to do. Behind the scenes, does that actually create the IAM policy needed to allow it to be granted? Yeah, we do a little bit of bootstrapping uh, in advance um, on, on all of our accounts at the time of creation to ensure that, that we can enable these services to have access to these accounts. But then for the specific uh, roles and rules, um, we, we do at deploy time uh, make configuration changes there. And so on the subscription side, the delivery service wants to know right, when uh, a pizza is done and, it, and, the, and the order is ready to be sent out. So uh, the, the team probably looks in our, uh, uses our uh, REST API to look up and, and examine the, um, the catalog of events, finds out that the pizza factory is actually publishing a, a pizza ready event. And so then they can import and instantiate a subscription construct, which basically says, I want that pizza uh, ready uh, event, and here is the event bus in my account that I want those events to land in. And then this is where uh, Event Hub does most of its work. So at, at the time that this stack is synthesized and deployed in AWS, Event Hub gets a notification, creates the subscription mapping between the subscription account and that, and that schema, and then goes back into the publisher account and drops in a rule and a filter specific to that event or set of events, um, and tells, which tells the event bus in the publisher account the, the destination for those events and where to deliver. The great thing about all of that is that during runtime after deployment, event bus is out of the way. There's no management of events. Um, there's no management of an event bus. We've built essentially a distributed architecture where ev events flow from publisher to, su to subscriber, um, and there's no centralized bus to manage. Does that also mean I, as the auditor, since we're going public, and I used that analogy earlier, could I just stand up a new stack and do the same thing? I can now subscribe to subscriber events, and my stack can get it and do what it wants with it? Yes. Extensibility is key, right? They can keep on moving on, subscribe to those events, and do what you need there. I think it's now time for Q&A. Are there any questions that we can answer for you? There's a microphone over there, or if you speak loud, feel free to yell at us. How is the Lambda used together? The question was, how is the Lambda being used together with CDK? Yeah. You want to so take that one? There's definitely a slide in here that talked about it. You would actually have your CDK in the same repo as your Lambda code. So it's TypeScript, you'd have app lambda.ts. CDK is smart enough to take those things and deploy your Lambda for you by taking the yeah. code, putting it in S3, and then linking it back to Lambda. So you write it all together in the same repo, and it deploys all at this one time. So the nice thing about that is now, because developers are, are taking a full stack approach, they're not just building their application code, right, the, the, the business logic within the Lambda or within a container, but, but they're also, through CDK, be able, are, are able to use what they're familiar with in terms of uh, application code to build the infrastructure that's gonna, gonna uh, provide all the supporting resources for that, right? So not only does CDK then deploy that Lambda and whatever layers or supporting libraries that Lambda might need, but also the DynamoDB table and the API gateway that that Lambda might need if you're building, say, a serverless REST API. So it sounds a little obtuse, but if you've never done it before, I would encourage you to Google AWS blog CDK or AWS workshop CDK. And you will find our workshops that are prescriptive, they are self-paced, you can do them at home, you do them in your own account. Depending on what you spin up, there might be a cost to those resources. They'll walk you through creating a new CDK app, we have blogs about it that are really great to read through. And that's where I would really start is either the blogs or the workshops. You can kind of see this holistically instead of the cut pieces that we've done here in the deck. And I will mention, um, we, we talked before about our Pipeline Forge and Pipeline service. Um, since we've, 
we've built that service, uh, CDK has now built a very nice and opinionated, easy way to generate um, pipelines in your own CDK stack. So you, now you can couple not just application code and infrastructure code, but you can couple deployment code as well. And so I can specify the lambdas, DynamoDBs, and API gateways, and I can specify that I want a pipeline to deploy all those things. Are you referring to the construct CDK pipelines? CDK pipelines. So one of the most popular constructs out there, the L3 constructs we talked about, and you can find them on constructs.dev, I believe is the, the actual URL, is CDK pipelines. And it's an opinionated pipeline that you can just import that construct, yeah. and you will get AWS code build, code pipeline, code deploy. It does all of those things. So our code star suite that we have, it wraps it all together and makes it very easy, but opinionated to use that construct. Super powerful and quick to adopt. Yeah. yeah. Well, the project might be for other high code. Yeah, good question. Um, we're, we're still uh, uh, in many parts of the organization heavy users of, of Terraform, um, Ansible, Chef, lots of different tooling. Um, and, and that goes along with our sort of practice of enabling teams to use what they think is, is the best tool for their, their problems. Um, what we, we sort of drew a line around our platform approach um, and really said, you know, um, to, to operate in this platform and build microservices in our new architecture, we, we want you to use this serverless approach and we really want you to be able to use CDK. So we, um, in, instead of sort of a stick approach, we, we've really presented it as more of a carrot approach. Like, this is, we try to make it as easy as possible, right, to, to use those things and make the environment such that developers are really comfortable. They, they don't need to um, worry uh, a whole bunch about understanding how Terraform works and, and doing all the kinds of machinations that you might do in other infrastructure as code projects, but be able to use the native languages they're comfortable with. I do find that people have a cognitive burden and lift when you go from infrastructure as code to is code and thinking about all the things you can do, you're still trying to define things declaratively, and that works. You don't get the power, right? You don't get that inheritance, you don't get the base classes, all, all those things that are extensible is really, really powerful. So sitting down with customers, sitting down with engineers, walking through what they're trying to do and showing them samples, they'll start to get it, and then they'll start to really realize the power. Yeah. But it's certainly not the first iteration when you go through CDK, do you start to think, well, how can I abstract this and use this in other places, or build a construct for reuse? What I encourage people to do is look for those things that you do often. Yeah. API gateway to Lambda is you know, probably the most popular one that our customers do. Look for that construct, how can you reuse that? And really it's about expediting your way to done and out the door um, and just building on the shoulders of giants from the community. And, and I'll say, it, this is such a, CDK is such a natural thing for developers um, because it, it fits the languages and the patterns that they're used to, right, thinking about that, um, they get really excited about it really fast because then they, they see the tremendous power uh, and, and ease of lift in, in doing infrastructure. Okay, so I hand over here. Ah, so Sam's interesting. I think that these are complementary in some fashion. CDK is really meant to allow you to use your language of choice to define that infrastructure, which is different than the SAM CLI tooling, which kind of wraps that together. Uh, we've even talked about, well, how do I migrate SAM applications to CDK? And there's no clear path right now to do that. Yeah. Uh, you'd really have to take the code out of your Lambda, bring it into a CDK project and work on it that way. Um, they are different toolings and slightly different meanings. And they're actually just different generations of tooling, right? We're starting to see a, a, a push for higher level languages and things like Pulumi and CDK, and it's, it's kind of really exciting to meet developers where they are. So our friends that work in C Sharp or Java don't have to go learn Terraform or CloudFormation or something else, which can be daunting. And oftentimes you end up with one person on the team that knows it really, really well, and they're in charge of all the deployments, when really you have a whole team of engineers that are really smart. If they can use the language of choice, they can all contribute to the greater good of deployments and deployment management. And I'll, I'll say just to, to clarify that um, code pipeline, code build, those uh, developer facing services, they, they support deployment with SAM. And in our pipeline forge, we made sure that we could support SAM templating deployments as well. So we, we haven't eliminated that possibility from developers, but now that they've seen sort of the, 
the power and flexibility they have with CDK, where the, the SAM template projects are, are you know, sort of disappearing. I think it's that hand over here. Let me handle the first question, you handle the second one. Okay. So there are different schools of thought about deployment. One is I have static infrastructure and I run through deployment and I put my code on that so the infrastructure doesn't change. That is one way to do it, it certainly works. When we, what he's doing is, and his team is doing is immutable infrastructure. We build that infrastructure once and it's consistent and we rebuild it, we tear it down, we rebuild it. That's Amazon best practice, we really recommend you don't have an EC2 that you just drop your code on, tear that bad boy down, send it back up. It's important for a number of reasons, portability, mutability, you get all the newest security patching because you're using the newest OS images, right? I don't have that static Windows server, that static Linux server that I'm deploying my code to but it's running behind on CVEs. So from a best practice, we really recommend you pave what you need every single time. It's called immutable infrastructure. And that's the difference there is when it comes to VPC infrastructure or other types of infrastructure, yeah. I look at that and I separate them based on the life cycle. You will build your infrastructure for a VPC and security and guardrails around. That's a separate project altogether than what you might build for an application that runs on these containers or these EC2s. And you think about the deployment lifecycle, and that's how I would align them. I would actually keep the code bases separate. Yeah, and, and um, another point about CDK and, and um, the way it gets built and deployed, when you synthesize a CDK stack, um, that's already been deployed, it actually looks for the differences between your, your code, current state of code and the infrastructure that's been deployed in CloudFormation and then only makes the changes that are required. So it doesn't, so it, it essentially treats pre-deployed infrastructure as immutable, right? And only updates the things that it needs to update. So in the case where you might only change pieces of your application code, say the logic inside a Lambda, it will only redeploy that Lambda and not touch the other pieces of, of the supporting infrastructure. So that's, that's a really nice feature, uh, an important feature of CDK. Um, you can affect all of that in CloudFormation as well using change sets uh, and updates. Um, what was the second question? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a collaborative approach. We, we um, have a, a very good platform engineering team that's, that's put a lot of time and effort into thinking about these things. Um, but they, they work very closely with the, the um, engineering teams that are working on the platform to try to help them um, help themselves. And so, um, as I mentioned before, that inner source approach is that practice that allows that collaboration and, and contribution uh, flow back and forth between the teams. Any other questions? One in the back? Yes, I have questions. So uh, do you have any restriction for developer to provision using the CDK? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. A little bit, there's a little bit of echo in the speaker. Oh, so do you have any restriction for developer to deploy the uh, resources using CDK? Are there any restrictions for the developer to deploy those resources with CDK? Is that the yes. question? Yes, yeah, does it require administration flow or? Um, so our, we, we can impose restrictions uh, in our pipeline process and, and uh, I had talked about our permission boundary um, and, and teams need to be able to tell us which services, resources they're gonna, they, they want to be able to deploy and use. Um, we, we have a, a set of those that we've already built uh, constructs for that, that determine that permission boundaries. What, what we've um, also done is open that part out to inner source, so if teams encounter a new uh, service in AWS that Pipeline Forge doesn't know about yet, 
um, they can contribute that piece of code. Um, and that goes through a review process where we look and see if the settings that are gonna be made uh, and the permissions that are needed um, are, are valid and, and um, are, are useful for, for everybody. And with that, I, I caution customers not to do allow listing of resources or resource types. I would rather you think about doing deny listing of certain resources you don't want spun up. Maybe you don't want a 16XL spun up or something right. in, a, in a lower environment. But if you only allow list the things that you want to allow, keeping up with AWS's velocity of new instances, new instance families, new, new types of services, that's a full-time job. So really think about what are you trying to do by limiting developers and lower accounts. If it's budgets, set up an AWS budget. Set up, a, set up an alert if you're worried about cost overruns or something else. Go back, to the, ask yourself, why do we need to put restrictions on? Is it cost allocation? Is it cost analysis? Is it I don't want them using the specific service because there's licensing fees? That's fine. So that's where I would challenge you to think about deny list, not allow list, because it's really hard to keep that, that list up to date. Yeah, you don't want to pinch upon developer in, in, innovation and speed, right? Yeah. Um, at, uh, um, this is probably a good place to actually plug control tower and service control policies as, as a means to be able to implement um, top level centralized management of, of these kinds of policies. And so. outer boundaries that uh, would prohibit you from spinning up maybe a 16XL in your developer account. Right? There's very few reasons you need to do that in your developer account. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Please. There, there's um, resources that you can go look at. Yeah, so there's a great tutorial in the CDK documentation on, on building a pipeline with that CDK pipeline construct. Um, and I know we've run across a couple different uh, articles out there on, on similar patterns that we've that we developed with our pipeline forge. So, yeah. Yeah, I always plug Googling AWS blog and the thing you want. Look for the authoritative source. Our blogs go through multiple levels of like bar raising and technical review before we publish them. There are some other great blogs out there, but sometimes I find that they are either out of date or inaccurate. And so I always look for AWS blogs first for these things. If you can't find what you need, I am AWS Tyler at Amazon. Email me, I will find it for you and I'll send it back to you. Right, we have the, you wanna click to the next slide? Oh. Um, and I'll say that there's, a, there's another open source project called CDK Patterns, um, which is, is a collection of um, CDK projects that um, try to aim at best practice for certain patterns, say, API gateway to Lambda to DynamoDB. And it's a really easy um, way to sort of start practicing uh, with CDK um, and see how those uh, patterns work. Yeah, we're both very active on GitHub and on LinkedIn. You can tag us in a comment. If you had a question, we're happy to engage with you, even direct yep. messages. Uh, don't feel like you can't reach out to us. We want people to see the power that Blackboard's been able to see and just that, that acceleration and developer happiness is the only way I could quantify it. Yeah. Um, that's something that's often lost, right? And so if you're struggling with this yourself, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to talk to you. If you don't have a named account team, if you do, we can work through them, whatever that is. We want your developers to be happy and yeah. successful and safe. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap for the day? Oh, one in the back. Can you use the microphone if you don't mind? <laughs> Thank you very much. Have you, can you hear me? Have yes, you, speak into it, there you go. Have you explored uh, Amplify as well? You know, yes. Before getting into CDK and uh, what, what were the differences you felt uh, between Amplify and CDK, which made you choose CDK? So Amplify is a, it's positioned differently. Amplify is a ease of use tool to do things like GraphQL and access cloud-based resources for either mobile or web-based, like browser-based applications. It is different than CDK. While it can spin up resources um, like IVS for video and other things for you, it's positioned differently. Um, it is really meant to be a single construct for your mobile application development or your web application development with related to those services that we wrap and make easy for you to use. It supports web sockets, um, so you can do real-time communications and notifications. It's different than CDK is really for your infrastructure. Amplify is a tool set that is similar to some of the other tools out there for like storage, notifications, and things like that. They're slightly different. Anything else? Any questions? One more? 
We have 30 <laughs> seconds. Oh, sorry, thank you. So um, I think to come back to the, 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 uh, the roles and the, uh, of the developers, so, the reason is that you mentioned about the restriction. So uh, we have an issue with just about because of security. So like, like the security team doesn't want us to do some certain thing. So that's why like, we had to see is there any way to reuse one of the, some of the resources already defined through the CDK. Well, let's, uh, let's talk after the, after the session. I'm happy to talk with you a little bit and kind yes, of explore you. where you're at. It, it's hard to give prescriptive guidance when I don't know enough about the subject matter and the events that happened that might lead to certain decisions with your security team or infosec teams. And those are important decisions we all have to yeah. consider, right? When you think about risk, um, what is right for you and your company might not be what's right for Blackboard and their company. It, it really all depends. So I'm happy to talk to you after the session. All right? All right, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Much appreciate your time and your attention. Thanks. Uh, thanks.